If Jesus had lived today and not 2,000 years ago, he would have been not a carpenter, but a craftsman in metal like yourselves. The nature of metal, how it can be forged, shaped, and hammered by your skills into an engine, holding inside a fire to make power, to speed us through the world. You kind of replicate the sports race cars, the 315s and the, and the 335s that we used in the film. You couldn't possibly use the authentic ones. We needed cars to be safe, reliable, and very, very fast. Yes. Michael Mann asked us to reproduce cars from the Mille Miglia of 1957. We are using the old techniques that makes the car wonderful. But we are at the same time using new technology that can give us more information. We replicated those cars by doing 3D LiDAR scans of real cars. And uh, then we put that the, the shape together with a tubular chassis, which we designed we create two kinds of cars. One is uh, fiberglass cars. The other is metal, because they are going to be crashed, and so they need to be realistic when they crash. We are having a few of the cars actually made from aluminum body panels, where the guys are hammering out the, the aluminum in the shapes necessary hammer welding them together, and it's absolutely gorgeous. I mean, to the point where it's like, we shouldn't even paint these cars, that you can see the craftsmanship. It's handcrafted. And anything that's handcrafted, I think, has a, a soul on it. You feel that energy because of all the, the time and thought and emotion that is put into it. This is much better. Why? Oh, and we look at other objects that are designed, you know, 70 years ago, they don't stand the test of time. These are museum objects. They're absolutely stunning and they're gorgeous. And they're not self-conscious art objects. No one is sitting there in Ferrari saying, well, let's make an art object that moves. But it's just the opposite. And so Ferrari is saying, I build engines to risk the car you get for free. And they're not designed to look good. They just do look good. It looks better. And all life, when the thing works better, Usually it is more beautiful to the eye. You are going broke. So what do I do? Win the Mille Milla, Enzo. Or oh, you are out of business. A thousand miles across bad roads with sheep and dogs, anything can happen. We have to win the Mille Milla, then orders for sports cars will follow. Everyone's eye will be on it. Only one team will you win. Make sure it's you. The most famous race in Italy was the Mille Milla. I'm entering five cars. Collins, Arufi, De Portago, Van Trips, Jean de Bion. To me, it was a thousand mile race across open roads, through mountains, through towns, through Ravenna, to the outskirts of Rome, back through Bologna, all the way to Brescia in the north where it began. I've always loved this era in motorsports. It's the most romantic, probably the most tragic and dangerous period. Pre-war up until the 50s and the jet age, now we're accustomed to seeing big crashes and drivers walking away. In that era, they didn't. And if they made a mistake, it was usually deadly. This is an era in which the cars particular Ferraris made a tremendous amount of power. Everything in the Ferraris was cutting edge, but the racing of the period was lethally dangerous. The mortality rate of the spring team from 56 to 58 is about 50%. 
So what possesses these men in the, the prime of their life to do something like this? Make no mistake, all of us are racers, or I have been. We all are certain it will never happen to me. The answer is the belief that it's never going to happen to me. And my friend is killed. I give up racing forever on Monday. I'm back racing by Sunday. But the addiction puts you right back in that seat. We all know it's our deadly passion. Our terrible joy. It's a meditation, I think, in many ways, because the speed is intense and focus required. You don't really think about anything else. So there's a cleansing process of the mind where you don't listen to all the voices in your head. There's potential dangers at every single turn. Okay, go for it! There's an unknown that could happen at any moment, but how in the midst of someone who's doing something incredibly dangerous do you stay myopically focused on what you're trying to accomplish? One race, a thousand miles across open roads will determine some, not all, of the issues that are colliding in these three months of 1957. So what do you think? There is no ashtray. Are you a prima donna? The core of this character is always forward-looking. Asked many times, what's your favorite car of all the cars you built? He always had the same answer, the next one. It was the next piece of technology, the next innovation, the next race. When we win, I can't see my cars for shots of starlet's asses. When we lose, you're a lynch mob. Everybody has an opinion about their version of Enzo Ferrari. It's enough to make the Pope weep. He was different with everybody. He was different with the women in his life. He was different with customers. Your Highness. Which Highness? Than he was with racers. That Highness. You, get out to the track. Enzo's relentlessness and ambition and myopic focus, I completely understand. There is a similarity between Adam Driver and Enzo Ferrari in Adam's origins. He met Agnelli at Fiat about a job. I was 19, I needed a job. The secretary came back with a card, one word written on it. He didn't get it. No. That was a long time ago. Adam applies to Juilliard, rejected, joins the Marine Corps at 19. That moment of defeat and humiliation was a big catalyst for the rest of his life moving forward. After the Marine Corps, he goes back to Juilliard and studies, and he's determined asking himself, who do I want to be in this world? And he discovers his passion for acting, and nothing will stand in his way. He wasn't from an elite family that had a lot of opportunity. He had to make it. And same with me. I have nobody that's in the entertainment industry, but it's something that I loved and felt confident, where it's like, well, no one can stop me from doing it. We all know it's a deadly passion. And I thought that he's Enzo Ferrari in here. A terrible joy. And there was such an integrity to the pure artistic ambition. I mean, very healthy, ego-driven artistic ambition that will drive an actor as it drives Adam to, I have to get there. I have to be in this moment. I have to be in this state of mind. I have to feel within these certain emotions surrounded by all kinds of sensory input. You blame me for his death? And then a stimuli comes in, a line from Lara. If I blame you, I blame you, because you let him die. The father deluded himself! And then the reaction is spontaneous, and it's Enzo's reaction, it's not Adam's reaction. Ferrari was the man who had been a race car driver to begin with. His sole purpose in life is racing. It's a race car company that on the side builds passenger cars. Jaguar races only to sell cars. I sell cars only to be racing. We are completely different organisms. You have that unity that occurs when you're doing everything right and you're just in a state of flow. Vera pulls up next to you. Challenging. You're even. But two objects cannot occupy the same point in space at the same moment in time. You lift. He passes. 
He won. You lose. So I wanted Adam to have that experience. We raced Ferraris when we were in Modena. When you're going that fast and you're trying to find the apex of the curve and every second lost is a second off your time, the focus that's required in racing was helpful in playing who he was now, running a business, understanding the mentality of a racer. That you can't be off focus for a second, or that means death. And then building a wall because he experienced so much death. And that's it for today. Total quiet. No one talk. I think it's always good to surprise yourself as you're shooting, just to make sure that you're on point, even if it's totally way off. Cut. Right. No deal. I have the luxury of not being the one responsible for what is inevitably used. That's Michael's decision. And I don't want to leave the set with regret that we didn't exhaust every opportunity. The first time you see her, she's pointing a gun at him. So you are being introduced a character that maybe she doesn't have so much more to lose because she lost what she loved the most. Laura the car broke. When I read that was the presentation of my character, I had so much fear. I was really having doubts on how we could make that believable. What's going on in there? Her gentleness, the signora, is trying to shoot the commendatore. Michael was right, and he said, like, there is no way I would change that. That is going to stay, and it's going to work. And there you have it. You knew about her, and you never told me? He is entitled to an heir. I gave him one. As it turns out, one was not enough. I gave him one! I gave him one! Playing this character is like, okay, who is this new person that I have to really get to understand as deeply as I can? When you end up understanding them, you end up loving them. Of course, you're going to go through paranoia and doubt and insecurity. And cut. But, but he's there holding your hand through that process. The signing of these affidavits was conditional on the exchange of the check. I'm sure it was an oversight. Bullshit. There's a primitive certainty about Penelope. Go away. Give me a thing. And, and an unselfconsciousness and a judgmental quality that was absolutely this character. She is locked into a state of grief that's impermeable. She lost her son Dino a year ago. You blame me for his death? Yes, I blame you, I blame you. Could you let him die? The father deluded himself! The great engineer! Michael told me, you want to come with me to the real apartment where Enzo and Laura lived? And there was something that happened to Michael and I with the wallpaper. Such a strong effect on me, and he saw it, and I said, Michael, did you see, where is this print, these colors? We copied it, and it seemed to bespeak that woman who was in the inside, who was so vivacious, so spontaneous, so of the moment, the Ladala Bufa, which just means like a card. One condition. I want my gun back. The relationship is this fascinating dichotomy. I'm gonna give you power of attorney over my stock. For half a million dollars. I don't have half a million. You will if you make a deal. Their foreplay is negotiation. And I think that's really telling of who they used to be. He falls in love again for a moment, and then they get to relive it for a second. I feel it's a combination of the love that is still there, the damage, the pain, but also like it's a release for that pain. That encounter that they have in that moment is full of rage uh, and anger about what they lost. And they share that. Well, I don't like
like to be an observer looking distantly at something. I want it to engage me and take me there. It's not simply the place, the furniture, the wardrobe, what the streets look like, and all that detail, which is terribly important, but it's also period accurate attitude psychology, the absence of psychology. He is very interested in internal life. Internal life is 90% of all of his notes. Doing the deep dive and trying to recreate a cultural reality and a psychological reality. Excuse me, please, my husband isn't here. He's out, whoring. Grazie, buongiorno. What's the stereotypical marriage in bourgeois, regional, provincial Modena in 1957? What's the authority structure? Because Enzo's irreverent. He disputes authority and makes his own way. If Anthony is looking for a scapegoat, then here I am. But that's different than somebody exercising free will where there's no authority structure and they don't have something to push against. When we lose, you're a lynch mob. <laughs> It's enough to make the Pope weep. It's the value system, it's all of those things, and that's not work. That's the adventure of it, and I can't imagine any reason to do it any other way. You generated all of these unresolved things without how they else are now. Michael is not only paying attention to our performances, he's paying attention to the way the light is moving in every single take, the way the camera operator is conducting his business, and there's so many different elements at play. Get some people to walk through. I don't see anybody. It's all too static. He's a conductor. He's waiting for the, that perfect, perfect symphony to come together. His focus is, I think, challenging for a lot of people. Let's go. Because you have to just be with him and just go on the ride and just expect the unexpected and be ready to go with it. And I think that's a good artist, is they take what's happening in front of them, very much like what's going on in the car on the track, and you adapt and you make it work for you. Let's get that camera here. Okay. For me, director photography is, is a casting process. I think we should try and get the over at the same time. I wanted a particular kind of active lighting that's apparent in Caravaggio's paintings where the light seems to enter very dramatically and it's almost as if accidentally the light is hitting a part of a leg, a hand, a slice of light hits a face. Michael's command of the frame, his use of the frame is such a signature of his and it's specifically tied to what's happening dramatically in the scene between the characters. Thank you, Mark. The dramatic scenes have a certain stateliness and uniformity within the color and the camera movements and that opposed to that every time there's a race car. And the race cars are red, vibrant, savage. When we get in the cars, the camera's handheld and it's in the passenger seat next to the driver and you feel the road noise and you feel the dust on your face. You could easily have made this a movie that's just cars moving fast. But I never feel like in Michael's movies he sacrifices character for any kind of spectacle. Ready? And roll, please. Michael gives his actors space and is intelligent enough to not control that. There is a shorthand, there's that respect. When to give them something that will open them up or when to kind of, you know, be invisible. He's there holding your hand through that process. He's thought of every angle. We all know it's our deadly passion. Our terrible joy. A millimeter will change everything for him. That's good, that's good. But not to say that he doesn't have his own sense of improvisation himself. He still is making up shots and following impulses. He is like non-stop for like 16 hours a day. And I know that when he goes home, he keeps writing or editing. And he's a machine. And cut, Six. Right. no deal. Two objects cannot occupy the same point in space, at the same moment in time. The corner races at you. You have perhaps a crisis of identity. Am I a sportsman? Or a
competitor. If you get into one of my cars, you get in the wind. It's slow. And so, you're going broke. How? You spend more than you make. So what do I do? Win the Mille Milla, Enzo. Or you are out of business. This is a gun pointed at our head. You should assign me control of your stock. I have to have all the cards in my hand. Well, half the cards are in my hand. All of us are racers. It's our deadly passion. Our terrible joy. I wonder if we need to be back. How can I stay away? If Anthony is looking for a scapegoat, then here I am. You were supposed to save him! You promised me he wouldn't die! The father deluded himself! Objects cannot occupy the same point in space at the same moment in time.